Sorry, we had a little bit of technical issues again, but um, here and for those of you who've hung on and not disappeared in disgust, I really appreciate it and thank you so much. And it's lovely to see you again, a lovely day as well, uh, weather wise, and I hope you've had a good week. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll just kick straight off uh, with a quote actually by Hippocrates, who is the father of medicine. And Hippocrates was a wise, clever man. And he said that uh, Food is medicine and medicine is food. And science is starting to understand the depths and reality of that, those very wise, simple words. So today is going to be talking about food and why certain foods are good for you. And I think a bit like the sleep podcast last week, I hope you realize how important simple measures like lifestyle are in terms of allowing our bodies to function better. So in terms of the evidence, uh, the evidence will come from various sources, including Professor Tim Spector, who's a, a very well-known professor of genetics and author of an excellent book, The Diet Myth, uh, from Miguel Mateos, who's a, a clinical neuroscientist and nutritionist, uh, Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, GP author, broadcaster, uh, from also from Professor Lisa Moscone, Professor of Neurosciences and Nutrition, uh, Dr. Asim Malhotra, who's a leading cardiologist and was responsible for improving the diet in hospitals and getting better hospital food, um, and also research from a number of medical papers, including JAMA and the prestigious Cochrane collaboration, which those scientists among you will be very familiar with. Now, uh, I'll just quickly give, uh, sorry, I got a message. I'll check that everything's okay. Um, I'll give you a bit of a background on myself, just a brief one, because uh, some of you may have already seen the sleep podcast and before that, the, the podcast I did about my backstory, uh, but it's also to try and give you some understanding about that I have a little bit of legitimacy talking about these things. Um, my name's Satinda should have said that at the beginning. And I uh, was a, a GP in the NHS for 25 years. I worked in the NHS for nearly 30 years. Uh, unfortunately, I had to take ill health retirement a few years ago, but I'm currently retraining to re-enter general practice and I'm currently involved in the COVID emergency response. Uh, as well as that, I had a stroke when I was 20 years old as a second year medical student, and it was a dense completed stroke. So complete loss of motor function, sensory function, and speech in the entire right side of my body, uh, which at the time they thought was down to a middle cerebral artery uh, thrombus, MCA, as you are aware of, those of you who have discharged summaries without those um, initials on, um, but they now think it may have been a carotid artery dissection. Very slow recovery because it was extremely dense stroke and um, obviously written off in terms of return to medicine but I did defy the odds. And part of the reason I'm telling you this is that um, one thing I wish I'd had when I was 20 years old, all those decades ago, was hope, you know, for people who don't feel ready to quit on living life to the max. And all I'll say to you is that 34 years on, you know, I've had my ups and downs as everyone does, but I have really lived life to the max. I've had a successful career. I've raised a family. Uh, we have a small holding. I've landscaped my own um, large garden and opened it under the National Garden Scheme for several years. Uh, I run a charity for disabled people where we do garden therapy. Um, I've done lots of trekking uh, in my early years, solo trekking over several days, carrying my own kit. I've done sort of long distance sea swimming and um, you know, I, I, I've done all sorts of other pursuits as well um, in my life. I'm, I, I've always been active and I wasn't going to allow my stroke to prevent me from continuing to be active. I just modified it really, as I'm sure all you are doing as well. And I hope you continue to. And I, I hope and pray that you you get the most out of your stroke recovery over the years and that you go on to, to live a long, productive life as I have. But maybe not make some of the mistakes I had um, I've made over the years. Uh, 
by not overdoing it as much as I did. So going back to uh, the topic of today, I am very passionate about health. You know, I, I've seen it from a number of angles. I've seen it as a GP with my patients. I've seen it as a patient myself, having had a number of medical health conditions over my lifetime. I've seen it also through uh, the voluntary, my voluntary surface with, with clients who are disabled, seeing it in a different way through them as well. And one thing I've become aware of is that we do as medics reach too quickly for drugs. And I'm not saying, I'm not apportioning blame because I'm one of them, um, but it is a fact that we just don't have the time, but also the training to look at your lifestyle and your environment when you come in with your various complaints. And we aren't always aware, in fact, we're often not aware of the evolving science which is out there on the impact of, of lifestyle on our health. Did you know that, for example, 50% um, of what we learn when we're at medical school is either obsolete or plain wrong within five years? And that's, that means as a, as a doctor, you have to be retraining or reading and rereading stuff a lot, but you can't read everything about everything. And so you have to be careful that things don't slip through your hands in terms of useful information you can pass on to patients. And I think that's probably one advantage of retraining to enter general practice is it's like I'm relearning everything. And, and I'm, I'm really been surprised how things have moved on. And I'll explain that in a bit later on. We are aware that, well, I've certainly been aware for a long time of the increasing health burden on our NHS. And I've been convinced for a while that lifestyle represents important precursors to, um, to sort of deteriorating health. And I'm convinced that environment as well also affects the unhealthy choices we make. But that isn't all our fault. You know, in in this country, for example, it's not easy to access affordable, good food. Um, and it's too easy to reach out for uh, convenience foods, which are packed in all the wrong kinds of foods that really aren't gonna give us what our bodies need. And I'll give you an example. I had a, a, a hospital investigation a few days ago and the technician was, I overheard her saying that she loves smoothies, but she can't afford to make them every morning because fruit's too expensive. And that's quite damning really, that we can't have affordable access to the foods that nature has provided us. And it provides an interesting uh, sort of dichotomy between what's going on in this country and what's going on in some other countries which do have good access to good food and where they eat it from a young age and where we know that they're less likely to develop uh, severe health conditions and they're more likely to live long healthy lives uh, and these are areas of the world known as blue zones and i'll discuss them a little bit in, in in a few minutes so we it's it's not always your fault you know it's what you're exposed to and if it's difficult for you to get hold of the right kinds of food then all i would say is you know i'd like to give you some practical advice on things which are affordable for everybody uh, during this talk. When I was um, when I was retired and I decided to set up a charity, um, I'd always felt this disconnect between how we practice in medicine and what I felt sometimes would be more appropriate for my patients. And it was nice seeing that I, I had an opportunity to put this in action. And when I um, had uh, clients, a lot of them with stroke. Uh, or multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease and so forth, um, working out in the garden. The fact that they were socially interacting, the fact that they were in green space, the fact they were moving, um, the fact that they were interacting and de-stressing and stretching, we did things like that as well. It did improve their well-being, and they also were moving more as well. So I have found that there are things you can do outside of conventional drugs which can help to improve people's well-being and i started to search in the right places for evidence behind this and i'd been doing it for years anyway before because for a while i'd felt that you know i'd rather prescribe welly boots than antidepressants for example in some cases 
And, um, and when I started to do even deeper research uh, into sort of the science behind what's out there on, on lifestyle and, and the food choices we make, which is this week's conversation, I found that there are quite a few like-minded and often acclaimed doctors who are researching this very thing and proving that this is the case. So what I will be discussing with you is based on uh, robust medical evidence. I talked about parts of the world where the diet is naturally uh, closer to the earth in terms of its source. And uh, these, there are zones that are known as blue zones, and some of you may have heard of these. And you've also probably heard of the Mediterranean diet. And when you break that down, these blue zones and Mediterranean diets, they're in all different parts of the world. They're not all in the Mediterranean. And the type of food they eat isn't all the same, but what they have in common is that the food is very diverse. It's like packed with microbes because of its diversity. It's packed with natural fibers and something called polyphenols, which I'll talk about in a minute. And it's tasty. And it's something that these people grow up with um, and they don't think about portion control or anything like that. They just enjoy these foods and they're naturally filling. So there's a good book, which I would recommend that you get, especially if you've got kids and it's called The First Bite by B. Wilson and B is spelled B double E, Buzzy B. And basically she talks about how the foods you eat as a child influence your taste buds and your expectations about what sort of food you feel you should be eating when you're older. But there's no reason you can't undo bad habits you might have um, collected over the years. So I used to have a ridiculous sweet tooth. I mean, at uni, I was called thin the bin because I ate like a horse. I ate all the wrong foods and I was stick thin. But I, I thought it would be impossible for me to wean myself off sugar and puddings. But I have been able to. And I, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie and say I don't have any of that stuff. I adore that stuff still, I really do. But I don't need it as much as I used to. And that's partly because when I wake up in the morning, I'm less hungry because I do certain things that mean that I'm not chronically stressed anymore when I wake up in the morning. And some of that I covered in my sleep podcast last week. Now, what we need to bear in mind is that manufacturers whether in the food industry or the pharmaceutical industry, have a vested interest in encouraging us to use their products. You know, evidence-based medicine has been hijacked by commercial interest. So what I would suggest is that when you go shopping and you look at your food, be wary of any packaging that has big, bright labeling on it, telling you of all its health benefits because it's probably false. I honestly would urge in those situations, you check the ingredients and the, and the percentages before you get hooked in, because that's all it is, it is a marketing ploy. They know we're desperate to eat well, and they know that we're busy as well. So they often stick these labels on the food packages, but just be very wary. Don't trust necessarily, in the, the, especially the brighter they are and the bigger and bolder, and the more outlandish the claims, it's most probably not true. Another thing to talk about, I talked earlier about how what we learn at med school, 50% can be redundant or, or plain wrong within five years. We, we were always told, and we're still being told, that cholesterol is all bad. Well, actually now we're understanding more about cholesterol and that it's a very complex um, molecule, very, very made up of lots of different types of of uh, fats and that you can have good and bad cholesterol. Now we have known about some of the good cholesterols like HDL and we know that if that's high that that's a good thing but we've tended to say to patients that if you have a high cholesterol and a high what we call LDL then that's bad for you but now there are cardiologists who say well it depends on what sort of LDL it is because there are two types. You've got these big fluffy LDLs which are nice and and bouncy and they actually can prolong life they're actually quite good for you and then you get these little pellet sort of size ldls which like zoom around and they cause lots of damage to your uh, your your tissues your arteries and they're not so good for you so it really does depend on what sort of cholesterol profile you have 
which then brings me on to statins. Um, as you know, a lot of people in this country and all over the world take statin drugs. And that, uh, and, and when you're, um, when you're risk assessed for whether you should go on a statin drug, it's based on a study that was done a long time ago, the Framingham, Framingham study. But unfortunately, that was flawed because it was looking at the results of people with extremely high cholesterol levels over 10 and with LDL levels of nearly over five. So it, it, it didn't really represent a lot of people who today will be put on statins. And there is a growing concern and understanding about that, that we shouldn't really base all our, uh, our sort of practice on that one study. So what we're increasingly realizing is that um, when we're um, assessing somebody's risk, we need to look at things other than just their cholesterol levels. Um, and we, we also know that there can be a risk associated with taking statins. So for example, um, they have done some research that shows that people can often gain weight when they go on a statin drug. And that's because people can think that the statin is going to protect them from getting a high cholesterol and therefore keep their heart healthy. So they feel that that's a legitimate reason to then go on and eat that bacon sandwich or eat that cream cake. And so they can actually end up putting on weight because they're less likely to be mindful of their portions or the types of food they're eating because they think they've got this amazing armor called statin now that's going to protect them from harm. So if you have got concerns about any medications you're on, then you should talk to your doctor about it because a lot more doctors are, are very clued up on all this and very happy to explain the science behind it. And then at least you've got an informed choice. The most important thing you can do is to keep your weight within a normal body mass index, to move more, to eat enjoyable and healthy foods. It must be enjoyable, it really must, because food is one of those great pleasures in life. To try and reduce your stress as well. And by that, I mean through things like sleep, which I talked about last week, but also through social interactions. And I'll come on to that in future podcasts about how um, bad for your health uh, loneliness can be, for example. Try occasionally fasting as well. Now, that's in order to give your digestive system a rest, or at least to have a nine to 12 hour window between the last meal you have at night and the first meal you have the next morning. And that's because it's important to give your gut biome a break. And it's also important to give your pancreas a break as well, because we're realizing that a lot of uh, conditions, health conditions are influenced by insulin resistance and our pancreas has to work hard on our behalf every time we eat uh, because it's trying to make sure that it can produce enough insulin to, to cope with all the sugar that's being consumed. So just try and reduce um, the, um, well, increase the window between your last uh, meal at night and that in the morning. And that's actually not so hard to create like a nine or better still 12 hour window uh, and that's kind of like a fast or better still um, you know try and occasionally skip breakfast like they do in the like they do in Europe because we're quite unusual us in America tend to have breakfast but it's apparently less common in Europe so um, I'm going to go on oh yes to, to mention one other thing about drugs and that is to let you know that um, the, the Cochrane collaboration made up of you know, very well-known eminent scientists, including Professor Gosler, um, has uh, established that uh, drugs, prescribed drugs, is the third most common cause of death after uh, coronary heart disease or, and, uh, and cancer. So drugs shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, but unfortunately, there are a lot more people on multiple drugs, so it's something to be very mindful of. They are associated with more falls, which can lead to hip fractures. There are some drugs like some antidepressants that can increase your risk of, of wanting to self-harm or worse still, suicide attempts. And there's a lot of other things that can be affected by drugs, like on your kidney, you know, uh, kidney function, liver function, and so forth. 
Now, there's a new organ in our body that's been discovered. It was actually discovered by um, Tim Spector a while ago, but it's stuck a bit like um, all medicine. You have to have lots of repetitive, robust evidence before it, it becomes absorbed into mainstream medicine. There's always a lot of skepticism with new, with emerging medicine, with emerging science, but it's becoming now mainstream that we have this new body organ and it's called the gut biome. And basically the gut biome is responsible for so many functions in our body. It contains trillions, not millions or billions, but trillions of diverse microbes. And we've lost 40% of these microbes because of our diet being less diverse and more processed. These microbes are so important. They're important for our immune system, which helps us tackle things like cancer and infection. It's important for our heart health and it's important for our brain health as well. The more microbes and the greater the diversity we have, in other words, it's not just putting microbes in your body, they have to come from lots of different sources, then the more likely we are to get the different groups of microbes which allow us to do different jobs in the body. So we do need to have diversity in our food and even cultures that have limited food diversity. For example, the Hadza tribe in Tanzania, they don't have much choice. They have their, their root, a strange sort of root veg. They have um, some, some berries and they have their meat from their, their, their animals. But their diet is actually pretty limited in terms of diversity. But what they do have is that they don't have wet wipes or detox. They're not sterilizing all their surfaces. So basically, they're eating everything in their environment, not just the food. They're eating the, the, the animals that came from. They're eating the dust off the land. The, off, they're eating all the, 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 the cells of their neighbors and, and, and families. So they're getting their microbes from all over the place. But of course, we, we don't do that anymore because we, we sterilize our surfaces and we sterilize our food. So we need to get our, our microbes, our diverse microbes from a diverse range of foods. Now, there are, you've probably heard of terms probiotics, prebiotics. They're not the same thing. And I just want to run through those because it can be confusing. Probiotics. These are the things that you find in um, like um, your Yakult's and your fermented drinks like, and your, your bio kefir yogurts, your, your kimchi or your sauerkraut. Pro probiotics do not colonize the gut. So they aren't actually the microbes. But what they do is they get the microbes friendly with each other. So they're really good at facilitating our microbes to go on and do good work. So they're, they're actually very important, but then they get passed out. Uh, there's been some um, headline news in papers recently saying probiotics are, are rubbish, they don't do any good, but that's actually not true. Um, the, again, the journalists haven't read the science. Bottom line is that probiotics are brilliant for your gut system, but they're not part of your gut system. They go through it and on the way they facilitate uh, optimal function of your gut by your gut microbes. Then you have your prebiotics, and these are the, 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 the foods that you take in. Now, we cannot, we don't have these uh, in our body. We need to put them in our body. And this comes from a rainbow color of foods. And that's not Skittles and Smarties, by the way. <laughs> and that's not, so it's not processed foods. And these provide that microbial diversity I was telling you that's so important. And it maintains a strong, healthy and less leaky gut. Now I'm going to talk more about leaky gut later on. Now there are two main types of food which microbes feed from. Uh, the microbes feed from uh, fiber and they also feed from polyphenols. And polyphenols have other names associated. They are also called phytonutrients. They're called flavonoids, and they're also called antioxidants. And I think some of you may have heard the word antioxidants. So that's basically all that is, is polyphenols, which is basically uh, chemicals that come from the plants, the nutrients that come from the plants. So going back to the first of the two um, that, that different microbes feed off, which is the fiber, when I say fiber, I'm not talking about cereals and all bran. I'm talking about the fiber found mostly in vegetables. 
Um, so, and there are certain uh, fibers that uh, are more likely to produce certain types of chemicals, such as uh, found in leeks, onions, garlics, artichokes. And what they have in them is something called inulin. And inulin, uh, when it um, meets the gut microbes, it provides them with a massive source of energy, which allows them to go on and produce something called short chain fatty acids. And the great thing about that is that is important in regulating our metabolism and in sorting out and helping inflammation in our body and helping lots of diseases in our body. So eating the right kind of fibers in this situation is really useful. The other area that I talked about was polyphenols and these are found basically in in plants which have lots of color so you want to have like diverse deep rich colors the brighter the color the deeper the color the better and some fruits as well uh, are included in this things like blueberries raspberries actually have both fiber, high fiber content and high polyphenol content in them. And the great thing about raspberries is you can pick them in the summer, they, they keep that, that nutritious content, you can freeze them and they're still doing their good work on your gut biome over the winter months. And you can sometimes, at certain times there, you can pick them for free as well. So as well as vegetables and some fruits, other things that are rich in polyphenols include uh, extra virgin olive oil, uh, dark chocolate, uh, black tea and black coffee. The good advantage of polyphenols, as well as improving your immune function and influencing your brain, is they also relax the blood vessels go to, around your heart as well, so it's good for your heart as well. I'm going to go on and give you a little bit of science around gut brain health because there's some really fascinating research going on in this area. Now, last week, you may remember, I talked about the adrenal glands and how they pump out lots of uh, stress hormones, uh, adrenaline, cortisol, when you're under stress. And that, you know, we all have stress and stress isn't a bad thing. It's a necessary thing. It helps us deal with difficult situations. The problem comes when the stress is there all the time or most of the time when it becomes what we call chronic stress. And then it can be very damaging to our bodies. Now, the vagus nerve, um, I that's not a term I've mentioned to you before, before, but it's a really important influential nerve. And it starts in the adrenal glands and it goes via the gut all the way up to your brain. So it's like a main cable that runs through your body and it's really influential in so many ways. If you don't have good diversity in your gut, then you end up with something called a leaky gut, which I think I mentioned earlier. And what happens is your gut becomes leaky. Then the immune system thinks it's being attacked because all these things are starting to leak out from the gut uh, because of the poor microbial diversity. And they leak out of the gut and the immune system goes, ah, oh, we're being attacked, we're being attacked quick. And it, it produces and releases all these free radicals and these free radicals they travel via that vagus nerve that i was talking about and they they go all the way up to the brain and in the brain they cause inflammation and inflammation can lead to depression but it can also lead to some neurodegenerative things like alzheimer's disease or parkinson's disease so having a leaky gut is really not good for our for our brain for starters um, as, as I said, acute, acute stress, necessary, lion comes in the room, tiger, you need to fight it off. You need to have everything pumping and working. You need to get that instant sugar from your muscle. That's brilliant. The problem is that if, you, if that stress goes on for a while, if you've got stress every day of your life or most days of your life, then what will happen is that your body is still going to take that instant sugar from your muscle. But it doesn't just take a little bit from your muscle. It takes it from your gut muscle as well because yeah your gut is also made of muscle so it takes some of that sugar the sugar requirements from your gut muscle and what happens is that also makes your gut leaky so the bottom line is there are two things that can make your gut leaky chronic stress and having a poor microbial diversity both of which can then go on and cause all sorts of problems 
with inflammation in your body, including in your brain, which might go on to lead things lead to things like uh, depression, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, or or to uh, make those conditions worse. Professor Moscone um, has done some, who's a neuroscientist, has done some research on how the foods we eat affect our brain. Um, so I thought I'd talk about this. And the reason I'm talking about this is because our brain is the only organ in our body that doesn't regenerate. So like other areas of our hair, like a bone, skin, joints, cartilage, eyes, everywhere regenerates. But our I really wouldn't mind getting my hair cut because, you know, like the rest of you, <laughs> I miss my hairdresser. So we definitely know that our, our hair regenerates, but our brain does not regenerate. Only there's very small parts of your brain that, that they think do a little bit. Now, for somebody who's had a stroke where there has been some either small or, in my case, significant cell death, then... Um, you know, you really want to hold on to those remaining brain cells that you have. You really do. So it wouldn't be good to to know how best you can nurture your brain cells, regardless of whether you've got a full quota or not. So I'm going to give you some information about the top five brain foods that are good for you and why. The first one is good old water. So water underrated big time it really is we're a nation of camels we don't drink enough water but we're made up of 80 percent water and our body doesn't hold all that you know it needs us to put it in it needs us to give it water we know that if we don't get enough water to our brain we get brain fog we get fatigue we become confused we have reduced response time and our brain even shrinks if we don't, if we get dehydrated. So lack of water to our brain is really bad for us. And there isn't a single function in our brain that doesn't require water. So it's incredibly important. Important. The guidance is we should drink at least between 1.2 and 2 litres a day. And what I do is I have a, I have a one litre bottle and I fill it in the morning. And then I try and finish that by lunchtime and then I'll refill it and have a second loose bottle for the afternoon. And if you find that that's too much for you, then you can always have um, a 600 ml bottle, which is smaller, more portable. And at least you know you're getting your, you know, your one, minimum 1.2 litres of water in a day. And don't go putting anything else in it, not even flavoured water with a bit of lemon, especially not lemon, because that will rot your teeth, the acid. So just water. And actually, not filtered water because you want all the natural nutrients chemicals and minerals that are in the water you don't want to filter those out so the ideal is either to buy mineral water buy mineral water or, or in this country in a lot of areas tap water is perfectly fine as well and you can have a look and see what kind of the levels of nutrients in your tap your own tap water are and decide whether it's something you could drink but certainly you want to be drinking more water if you want to know how if you are really thirsty because some people say well i never feel thirsty so i don't think i need water there's a good test you can do on yourself if you just fill up a, a bottle with some warm water and take sips if you find that when you take a sip it makes you feel better and you want more that means that you're probably dehydrated and need more water so the other top brain foods the second one in my list unfortunately isn't one that we're going to be able to have access to or afford but it's the one which has contains the chemical components which most closely mirror the brain cell composition. Um, and that is caviar <laughs> and fish eggs. So not something that we have easy access to and certainly not something that our pockets have access to, but it's just an interesting to know one. Uh, so that's sort of your row eggs and caviar. The, the others are all very affordable. The next is fatty fish. Uh, things like your mackerel, your anchovies, your trout, your salmon. Um, they're all good alternatives for your caviar as they have a very good source of omega-3, as are certain nuts and grains, although you do need a lot more of those to get your quota of omega-3. The next one on the list is berries. I see it gets better. Um, 
they contain, they're packed full of those polyphenols I mentioned earlier. They're also anti-aging, they have lots of fiber and they're very good in sugars as well, the right sorts of sugars. Dark leafy green veg, so your things like your, your, your deep rich kales and your spinach, um, these are also rich in polyphenols, antibacterial as well, and so they protect you as well. Um, extra virgin olive oil, that's the next one on the list. A great blend of vitamin E, which is anti-aging, omega-3, and also monounsaturated fatty acids, which are good for your heart and your brain. And with regard to extra virgin olive oil, try not to buy the olive oil that's come from multiple different countries. That's where they've just basically, it's a composition from different blends. Try and get a, a single blend olive oil from, you know, a single source, a single country. You know, countries like Spain, Portugal, uh, Italy, Greece, have got have, have good reputations for their olive oil production and they're often made you know local farmers uh, who've been you know harvesting their crops over centuries and so they and that's that's the odd it's, it's more of a green color than a sort of a insipid yellow color and that's rich in the the right kind of food for your brain and actually for your body as well because it's rich in those polyphenols as well which help to feed your microbes in your gut too so the other, so going on to some sort of tips, I would suggest that at the very least, vary the, 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 the types of food you eat. Make sure they're colourful. Make for, sure that they're naturally sourced as much as possible. Try, you've heard about the fibre day. That hasn't worked very well at all, actually. Um, I think, you know, public health generally agrees that has not been, um, it has not been, uh, not, it, acknowledge as about them being a successful campaign and the reason for that is that it's so easy to misconstrue it well what does five a day mean you know people have said oh i've had some i've had this therefore this pizza therefore that constitutes two or three of my five a day or i had a, a can of tango or whatever so to be very clear if you really want to help your gut health you want to be having five different types of vegetables a day that's the key it should be vegetables and make them as a variety of colours. If you've got kids, or even for your own satisfaction, get a colour chart of the different colour vegetables, you know, your reds, your oranges, your purples, your blues, your greens, and your yellows, and stick it on the fridge. And every time you or your kids eat something that's one of the colours out of that, then tick it off so that it, it kind of incentivizes you or the kids say, oh, you know, I haven't, I haven't eaten a blue thing today. Oh, I'll just reach for a blueberry or whatever. So that's one thing you can do. Avoid eating late. It's really important. We discussed that in the sleep podcast last week. Allow at least between nine and 12 hours between the last meal at night and the first one that you have in the morning, giving your gut biome and your pancreas a break, a well-deserved break. Experiment with different cuisines. You know, that will also encourage your gut to receive a more diverse uh, food type and um, more likely to get from that the right microbes to help feed all the different systems which are doing you so much good. Double your fibre, uh, double your intake of fibre. You know, most of us are not, in fact, probably nearly all of us are not getting enough fibre in our diet. Um, we should, and by that I don't mean uh, all brown cereals, I'm meaning I'm talking about vegetables and grains. Um, eat those polyphenol rich foods I mentioned, especially those, the fruit and veg with the deep colours. I need a rainbow of colours, as I've said a few times, uh, but not those Skittles or Smarties. And avoid snacking as well, again, because you want to give your gut biome and your pancreas a rest. Really important that. Intermittent fasting, by the way, um, that is skipping breakfast at least twice a week, is really good for you if you have type 2 diabetes. And also bodybuilders use it because it's a good way to build your lean muscle mass. I see a lot of you youngsters out there being like, hmm, that's an interesting one. Last thing I'm going to talk about is hypertension and, and diet, because I suppose there'll be a few of you or a lot of you out there for whom hypertension is a risk factor, has been a risk factor, remains a risk factor, might be a risk factor in the future, such a common condition, um, and it's on the rise. So, in medicine, there is something called DASH, which is a dietary approach 
to stop hypertension. And it basically is a diet based around a lot of what we've already discussed. In addition to that, it, it focuses on low fat, especially low dairy fat foods, uh, high fiber, high fruit and veg content. So it's not, it's really very much what we've already been talking about. If you are prone to hypertension or you want to not get, get it, then I would suggest that you don't allow yourself to have more than the equivalent of a teaspoon of salt a day. Now, that's not as easy as you think because there's so much hidden salt in so much of what we eat. Uh, if you look on a lot of packaging, you make it a game with your kids or with your friends, you'd be surprised. Salt is in, found in all sorts of unexpected places. So a teaspoon is actually not that much and it's equivalent to about five grams a day. And they say you shouldn't have any more than six grams a day. So about, you know, just over a teaspoon or a teaspoon equivalent of salt a day is what you should be having at the most. You want to have, so you want to have less salt, but you actually want to have more potassium. Potassium is good for you if you have high blood pressure. And this is evidence based on it, reducing your systolic blood pressure by so many millimeters of mercury. Not many, but you know, small gains end up with lots of small gains end up with a, a big big win at the end so with regard to potassium you want to increase that from between about three and a half to five grams a day and potassium can be found in bananas avocado sweet potatoes spinach pulses and chicken the next one to talk about is alcohol now alcohol should be for both men and women now they've changed the guidance on this uh, no more than 14 units of alcohol maximum a week for both men and women. Now, what does that actually mean? What it means is if you're having an average strength pint of beer, that's no more than six pints of average strength beer a week. And if you're a wine, drink, wine drinker, then that's seven medium glasses of wine a week. And that is a, a medium sized glass is 175 ml. And if you want to know what that is by the bottle, for those of you who are keen to know, um, you get about 4.3 glasses in a bottle of wine. So that's some information about your alcohol intake. So I think that just about wraps it up for, for diet and food and eating this week. Uh, I just want to say thank you for, for joining me and for listening. And to say that next week, I thought it might be useful to talk about the importance of movement and the benefits of movement, especially as it's something you're all focusing on so hard during this period with our um, with our fantastic physios providing the daily exercise routines. It might be useful for you to know exactly how you're helping yourselves. Not that you probably already didn't know, but I appreciate you joining me and I look forward to seeing you next week. Stay well, everybody. Bye for now. Bye bye.